欢迎大都会酒店。嗯，我们给一个房间。嗯，好的。谢谢。请问您是要单人间和双人间？单人间。二零五十平方，请问您要订吗？It's just a normal Friday at the Metropole Hotel in Hong Kong. A number of guests are checking in for a large wedding reception this evening. On this February day in 2003, no one suspects that one of the wedding guests has brought along an invisible killer. Hello, sir. What can I do for you? Yeah, my name is Lu Jian. Uh, have Professor Lu Zhuanlun is a physician, 64 years of age, who has come from Guangdong, China to Hong Kong for his niece's wedding. Can you take my luggage? Of course, sir. Thinking that he has merely the flu, Lu does not suspect that an unknown virus is rampaging through his body. In the next 48 hours, this doctor will unknowingly infect at least 17 hotel guests with a deadly new disease and put the entire world in a state of alert. Before his departure, Professor Liu had been treating patients with febrile pneumonia. The deadly virus which he has been infected with will not be named for another three weeks, SARS. The ride in the Metropole Hotel's elevator will launch a worldwide epidemic, one that randomly strikes its victims. <coughs> American Johnny Chen is on a business trip. He is a textile company manager and is making a stopover in Hong Kong on his way to Hanoi, Vietnam. Canadian Quan Su Chu has been visiting relatives in China. She is flying back to Toronto tomorrow. <coughs> Approximately 50% of all the SARS cases in the world were linked, epidemiologically linked back to this Chinese uh, physician from Guangdong province. We are constantly under attack. Viruses make countless attempts to invade the human body every day, from morning until evening, as well as during the night. Many more than the number of computer virus attacks from the internet. My main message is expect the unexpected. Yeah? So there is so much out there, we can never predict what's going to happen. Every cellular life form on the planet, whether you be a bacteria, a parasite, uh, a worm, a human, you know, animals and plants, they're all infected with viruses. And it's thought that just about every one of those species probably has at least one distinct, unique virus that infects it. And what that means by definition is that the most diverse forms of life on the planet are viruses. Viruses have been killing humans ever since the existence of mankind, even though we've only been able to see them since the creation of the electron microscope, a device that makes the invisible visible. Nobel Prize laureate Joshua Lederberg wrote, the single biggest threat to man's continued dominance on the planet is the virus. They are looking for food. We are their meat. Even though we know what the pathogens for polio, AIDS, dengue, measles, Ebola, SARS or the bird flu look like, there are only vaccines for a fraction of these deadly viruses. In the 20th century alone, more people died from viral infections than from all the wars around the globe. Infections have filled the cemeteries of Europe and left behind fingerprints that are difficult to decipher. At an excavation in Berlin, molecular biologist Barbara Bramanti is searching for traces of the Black Death and for evidence as to why some people survived it. The Italian scientist is searching for traces of DNA in the teeth and bones of bubonic plague victims. Her starting point was the discovery of a genetic defect that's still prevalent in contemporary Europeans. It is a tiny mutation that blocks the immune receptor CCR5 and with it an important gateway that viruses use to enter human cells. The same mutation now protects humans from a modern plague, HIV. Approximately 1% of northern Europeans are resistant to HIV. 
Is this an after effect of the plague? The CCR5 protein is the gateway for HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, and probably also for other germs, for example, the bacteria that causes bubonic plague, Yersinia pestis. A mutation inside this protein clothes this portal and makes it inaccessible for microorganisms. This means it's also closed to the virus. The general perception, if you imagine a receptor gate that must be broken through, is the idea that there is only one gate. But my idea is that there are about 50 gates that have to be broken through. <coughs> On the ninth floor of the Metropole Hotel, three flight attendants from Singapore head out to go shopping. They have no idea they are waiting for the elevator with Professor Liu, as is an airport employee from Hong Kong who had been visiting a friend in the hotel. <laughs> Professor Liu wants only to rest. The dry coughing gets worse and worse. <coughs> With each cough, he's launching droplets full of SARS pathogens into the air. Like all viruses, they are too small to have their own metabolism and cannot reproduce on their own. Outside of a living cell, they are nothing but lifeless dust. Like zombies, they constantly require new victims in whose cells they awaken to life. Isn't it fascinating that something you cannot even see, yeah, but this has a coding capacity that's so terribly small, it cannot even survive on its own. It needs a living cell. And we're beaten by that. Yeah? You know, we're being challenged by that. Albert Osterhaus is one of the world's foremost virus hunters. Like almost all of the world's experts, he is convinced that a mutated influenza virus will wipe out millions of people in the near future. If there is a vaccine at all, it will only be available for a fraction of the world's population. According to Professor Osterhaus, overpopulation and tourism are fertile breeding grounds for a catastrophic death toll caused by viruses. When there's too many animals or too many humans, by definition, there is more opportunities for infectious agents, including viruses, yeah, to actually uh, reduce the population. And that's a natural mechanism. So, so if, if our population continues to grow as it does, indeed, there, there will be more opportunities for infectious diseases and especially for vir viral diseases yeah, to actually combat the human species. SARS infected Professor Liu leaves behind a trail of millions of germs in the Metropole Hotel. They adhere to everything. Walls, handrails, elevator buttons. The invisible life form can survive up to six days without finding a new host. The invisible droplets in the air that American businessman Johnny Chen has inhaled transport the first virus particles into his airways. There is a protein on each virus that is used like a grappling hook to dock onto a certain type of cell. Like biological pirates, the SARS viruses board the cells of Johnny Chen's respiratory system. Viruses have just one mission, to copy themselves. This is the only way they can reproduce. With chemical messengers, they take over command of the cells and force them to churn out virus copies until the cell dies of exhaustion. An army of new viruses then burst from the outer cell wall with just one goal, attack all neighboring cells. 
in approximately two days, we'll see if Johnny Chen's immune system can stave off the army of SARS viruses. <coughs> Professor Liu has already lost the battle. His immune system is now in complete turmoil. As of this moment, everyone in the elevator of the Metropole is in a state of war with the SARS virus. And most of these viruses and other things that sort of spread quickly, like the flus and the SARS, effectively, somebody will be infected, they'll either die or they recover, and when they recover, they're they're immune, so they're not capable of being infected again. So what that means is if you're a virus like that, you need constant fuel, you need more and more people, otherwise you're gonna burn through your population, that'll be the end of you. The lab of Paul Bienesch resembles a Jurassic Park for viruses. At New York's Rockefeller University, the British scientist has brought back to life a virus more than 35 million years old. Like HIV, it belongs to the family of retroviruses. At some point in the distant past, it infected the germ cells of our ancestors, becoming a permanent part of our genetic makeup. Almost one tenth of our genes are the residue of past infections. The retrovirus that Bianash resurrected from the dead died out millions of years ago. Apparently, our defenses were successful. Paul Bianash is working on the question can we learn something from this victory in our battle against AIDS? Our relatives, the chimpanzees, have already managed to defeat their variant of HIV. If you look in human DNA, you will find that approximately 8% of it is in fact ancient retroviruses. Just by looking at the sequence, we can tell that it used to be a retrovirus. And if you look at the, the retroviral DNA that's in humans and say, compare it to chimpanzees, you'll find that it's almost all exactly the same. In nearly every place where there are retroviruses inserted into human DNA, you'll find the same insertion in chimpanzee DNA. So it's in your DNA, and when you, your child is born, it, it, it inherits your DNA in part, and there the signature of that particular virus is present. With the last of his strength, Professor Liu managed to get through the wedding banquet. But the day after his arrival, he collapses. The doctor is admitted to Kwanghua Hospital in Hong Kong with a suspected case of pneumonia. <coughs> Liu has just 10 days to live. Day four after the brief encounter with Professor Liu, the three flight attendants from Singapore check out of the hotel. After returning home, they will infect a dozen doctors and nurses in hospital. Among them, a physician who shortly afterwards will land in Frankfurt, Germany. On day five after the elevator ride, the airport employee is also showing initial SARS symptoms. Soon after, he will be admitted to Prince of Wales Hospital. On station 8A, he will infect almost 150 people. He's what's known as a super spreader, but he himself will survive the disease. You see the signal that says there's a lot of people sick with respiratory disease in China. So what? People get respiratory disease in China every year. There are probably hundreds of thousands of cases. So what is it about a signal that starts to worry you? Those of us that work on influenza worldwide, we're starting to think, my gosh, is an H5N1 influenza pandemic starting in southern China? A worldwide outbreak of influenza would mean that millions of people, yeah, if not tens of millions of people, yeah, will be dying. Yeah, and, and let's say 20, 30 percent of the whole world population yeah, will be affected, will be ill, will be in bed. The CDC in Atlanta is the headquarters for fighting epidemics in the US, with a yearly budget of $8.8 .8 billion. 
the almost paramilitary organization can send their deployment teams to outbreak hotspots all over the world within just a few days, if they are invited to do so by the affected country. The experts from Atlanta are considered the best equipped virus hunters in the world. The CDC regularly rehearses worst case scenarios in their command center, one being a bird flu epidemic in the US. SARS was possibly just a dress rehearsal. The question is not if the next deadly flu pandemic is coming, but when. Experts estimate it will claim up to 150 million lives around the globe. In the CDC's 48 hour planning scenario, eight days after the start of the outbreak, there will have been 400 deaths. But this is just the beginning. We've gone to a situation where about 10% of all the people getting the infection are dying. That's way beyond our planning assumptions, but we needed to challenge ourselves with that because it's very possible that sometime, just as we saw in SARS, we could have an easily transmitted virus that did have a fatality rate that great. September 1918. The First World War is coming to a close, but another enemy strikes in the war's final weeks. The Spanish flu is infecting soldiers in overcrowded military camps and is spreading like wildfire. In emergency sick bays, doctors and nurses are practically helpless. And the men are dropping like flies. In the American camp Devons, 12,000 soldiers are already infected. On this day alone, 63 will die. In the spring of the same year, a less virulent strain of the flu first appeared in Kansas and crossed to Europe and Asia with troop transports. At the time, the virus appeared to be highly contagious, but fatality rates were low. In contrast, this new wave is fatal. Over the next two years, the flu will have killed 50 million people around the globe, two and a half times as many as died in World War I. <coughs> the soldiers have already nicknamed the illness Purple Death, a reference to the Black Death of the Middle Ages and to the bluish discolorations on the faces of the victims, a sign of massive oxygen deficiency. <coughs> Just a few days after the onset of initial symptoms, those taken ill have a high fever and appear to drown from within. This new flu virus destroys the lung tissues, often in less than 72 hours. Purple death strikes quickly and thoroughly, deep within the lungs. Doctors back then could not have known that this is a mutated bird flu virus. Today classified as H1N1 because of the spiky H and N proteins on the virus's outer hull. The H protein makes this virus an efficient killer because it provides the virus access where it is particularly fatal, into the cells of the smallest alveoli. There it produces tens of thousands of copies of its genome. Like all flu viruses, it doesn't consist of a single strand but of eight individual strands of RNA, and it is extremely prone to copying errors. If we look at the three pandemics that occurred in the 20th century, the 1918-1919 pandemic, the emergence of H1N1 virus, data suggests that that virus was a direct mutation from an avian virus. And what we have seen happening in 58, uh, 57 and 68 is that, that in that case, the two viruses got together in one cell, they free their genetic material and like, like uh, shuffling a deck of cards, yeah? you, you can get, you can shuffle genes between these two viruses and get a whole new virus, and this virus has the ability to go from human to human. 
The exchange of genetic trump cards is always fatal when the new virus manages to be transmitted from person to person, while at the same time changing the chemical structure of its outer hull. The immune system's antibodies have no trouble recognizing old, well-known flu viruses and eliminating them. However, the new mutants are suddenly camouflaged, making them invisible to the immune system. The human body developed new counteragents, but not before a painful learning process that claimed millions of lives in 1918. <coughs> The virus itself succumbed in the end to the efficiency of its destructive work. Survivors were now immune and had killed everyone else. Hubert Underdown, perhaps the first victim of the epidemic, is buried in Etaple Military Cemetery in Normandy, France. London's star virologist John Oxford and historian Douglas Gill want to show that as early as 1916, two years before the Great Die-Off, soldiers were falling victim to the Spanish flu and that the Purple Death was only just getting warmed up here. H1N1 initially killed only a few people, and it wasn't until its second or third season that it mutated into a killer virus. John Oxford fears that the current bird flu virus, H5N1, may be making a similar test run. In 1917, Dr. Hammond, the camp doctor in Atapla, warned about the new influenza. Douglas, I found Harry. Oh right, there he is. Harry Adam. But even the valiant Dr. Hammond himself might have underestimated its ultimate dimensions. Could we possibly be making the same mistake today? With this worry about H5N1, uh, people keep saying to me all the time, they say, well, how many people have died? A couple of hundred? Uh, and I say, yes, 200. Uh, and then they say, well, there's nothing to worry about, is there? Well, there's six billion people here, what's, what's 200? And I would say to them, Go back to Etapla, go back to the First World War, go back to the greatest outbreak of any infection the world's ever known, that's the 1918, but go back earlier, go back to Etapla and ask the question there. And if you saw Dr. Hammond, and you could say, how many people have died in your camp, Dr. Hammond? He would say 145. And you would say to him, well, do you realize, Dr. Hammond, that within 18 months, this is gonna transform itself, this virus, and it's gonna kill 50 million people? He would probably say, you're mad. Go back to the 21st century. On day six after the elevator ride with Professor Liu, Mrs. Kwon Su Chu is back in Toronto with her husband and family. The SARS virus travelled with her. Mrs. Kwan will live just one day longer than Professor Liu. Her son will unknowingly trigger a dramatic SARS outbreak in Toronto. He will also die of it. His wife and young son will survive the disease. <coughs> As planned, Johnny Chen has flown on from Hong Kong to Vietnam. By now, he is so sick that he calls an emergency physician. <coughs> In the French hospital of Hanoi, he'll infect 20 people before doctors ask the WHO in Geneva for help. <coughs> Looking at SARS mathematically, we can say that its basal reproductive rate, the R0, is about 3.6. That is roughly one-third the value of a normal influenza virus, and about one-tenth of chickenpox. And what this R0 value means is I'm an average infected person, and in the case of SARS, I will infect 3.6 persons. SARS is much more let's say, wimpy, yeah, than, than an influenza virus, because a proper, a normal human influenza virus 
yeah, a seasonal influenza virus or a pandemic virus, spreads quite easily from human to human very early on. So even before you have serious symptoms, the virus is already excreted, it's already traveling from one person to the other. With SARS, we were quite lucky because that particular virus, it took about three, four days before you were going to transmit it. This was a disease of, in general, very capable economies with capable health systems who were able to mobilize the resources needed to break this chain of transmission. My fear would have been, what if this disease had got to Africa? What if this disease had got into the poorest areas of Asia? Could we have stopped it? Twelve days before Professor Liu's tragic elevator ride in the Metropole Hotel, Steve Cunningham a retired U.S. Navy physician and bioweapons expert receives a strange email. One of his former neighbors in Hawaii had heard in an internet chat room about a deadly epidemic in China. However, there is no official information about any epidemics in China. Steve Cunningham immediately forwards the mysterious information to ProMed, an internet news service about infectious diseases. Anyone can post messages about possible outbreaks, which are then reviewed for credibility by a team of experts. ProMed has been fighting against the lack of transparency in health bureaucracies. The first thing you do in an outbreak investigation is you go to the source of the information. And so when neither CDC nor WHO came to me and asked me about my email on ProMed, uh, that essentially told me they knew about it beforehand. And so they didn't have to come to me because they knew about it. The SARS pandemic could have been prevented if the appropriate governments, who knew about these cases as early as autumn 2002, had immediately gone to the World Health Organization and said, we have a problem here. The agent had already been identified, but this was not allowed to be published. The World Health Organization cannot legally compel any country to let in its experts unless invited. In 2003, the Geneva headquarters were not allowed to publish news of outbreaks that had not been confirmed by the affected country. After SARS, this policy was changed. The difficulty in SARS was every time we looked around, there was another fire somewhere else. And that's very difficult to deal with because the demands on the organization changed. The demand wasn't to do something about an isolated incident. The demand was, was now, what's happening? Is this going to spread all the way around the world? Where is this disease going to arrive next? In the jet age, every point on the map can be reached in less than 36 hours. That is less time than the incubation period of the majority of viruses. Tokyo is just a short hop from New York, as Borneo is from Frankfurt. Deadly pathogens stow away aboard airplanes in the bodies of those infected, those who don't even know they're sick. A new record of 2.5 billion flights around the world is forecast for the year 2010. Modern cities like New York offer viruses millions of potential victims. Densely crowded, highly stressed, and frequently exhausted. We have a very complex mix of, of all kinds of changes in our society that create new possibilities for infections. Yeah? For instance, we, we, we have uh, our mores and taboos have changed. Yeah, we, uh, we, we travel all over the world you know, with, with enormous numbers of people. There is urbanization, enormous numbers of people together. There will be a new pandemic of some disease, be it influenza, SARS or something else. It's the history of mankind. Uh, so. Uh, it would be imprudent of me to say no. Uh, the only question is which organism, when, and what will its impact be? And, that, and that's the unknown. And uh, anybody who says they know that is, uh, is a fool. Dr. Carlo Urbani from the WHO field office in Hanoi is called to the French hospital. The nurses are terrified. 12 days after the elevator ride in the Metropole Hotel, Johnny Chen has already infected a dozen employees with the mysterious lung disease. He was the only WHO representative there at the time. He's a parasitologist, but uh, he had a pretty good handle on infectious disease control for, uh, for his position, and he, he did an excellent job. Dr. Urbani 
um, to me, is the hero of SARS for many reasons. He was the first to really describe the early epidemiology of SARS, the early clinical features, and he made efforts to try to control this outbreak in Hanoi. Breathe in, please. A little bit. Okay, thank you. And hold on. <coughs> oh, okay. On this day, Carlo Urbani examines Johnny Chen and no all the other out? patients with similar symptoms. Yes. At the start of his examinations, he assumes that these are cases of the flu. Could you lie down? Urbani is 46 and as healthy as Johnny Chen was a week ago. Okay. The Italian doctor doesn't know that he's taking the first samples of an unknown virus from Chen. It doesn't hurt. Okay. Four years ago in Stockholm, Urbani accepted the Nobel Peace Prize for the organization Doctors Without Borders. At the time, he said, it is the duty of every physician to stay close to the victims. So, can you cough in the cup? Okay. Johnny Chen's body is desperately trying to kill the unknown virus with a high fever. But the air exchange in his lungs is already dramatically impaired. What Carlo Urbani cannot see is that the cells of the alveoli are the preferred targets of the SARS virus. Millions of virus copies will destroy the walls of Johnny Chen's alveoli over the following days. It won't be until months later that scientists discover that a protein on the spikes of the SARS virus is the key. It opens a chemical lock on the surface of all lung cells known as ACE2. All human coronaviruses identified before that time normally deflect off it and simply cause a severe cold. The SARS virus, however, manages deep entry into the lung and produces a myriad of copies of its own genome. This will cause Johnny Chen to drown from within. <coughs> Carlo Urbani cannot yet see the massive lung damage on the initial x-rays. Despite all of Urbani's efforts, Johnny Chen will die in 10 days. When those cells are destroyed, if something goes wrong there, you have a very serious problem because, first of all, your exchange of the CO2 and the O2, yeah, so the normal exchange doesn't happen anymore. And also, you start, you start the process of, of leaking. Carlo Urbani is alarmed. He implements hygiene and quarantine measures primarily to protect the healthcare personnel. He examines the patients for six days and finally puts an end to the conspiracy of silence about this new illness. But when Urbani's wife Juliana learns of his mission, she is deeply distraught. E hai tre figli, non te lo dimenticare. Io penso a te, hai i nostri figli, ma ci sono altri genitori che hanno figli. E va bene, ne riparliamo dopo a casa. Ciao, cara. Sì. Ciao. A dopo. Ciao. Hi, Kevin. This is Carlo. I have a hospital full of crying nurses. People are running and screaming and totally scared. I don't know what it is, but it's not the flu, yeah? Can you call Pascal and uh, Lam Geneva? We learned an awful lot about, really in many ways, uh, to compare it to soccer, I felt like we'd been playing fourth division and doing it quite well, and all of a sudden somebody put us in the first division, and the demands and, and the time you had to do things and the expectations just grew exponentially. And I think we just about managed to do it, but I was that close, and we were so close so many times to the, the whole system imploding. 
For years, John Oxford from London's Royal Hospital has been studying archival records about the 1918 flu epidemic. During this time, US researchers decrypted the genetic code of H1N1 and reanimated the virus in the lab. They grafted the H protein onto a very normal seasonal flu, thus turning it into a killer virus. John Oxford is certain what succeeded in the laboratory can happen naturally at any time. The perfect example being the Spanish flu. Like SARS, the bird flu of 1918 afflicted deep regions of the lung, but it was significantly more contagious. John Oxford found tissue samples from flu victims in the hospital pathology collections. One thing is certain, influenza viruses are far more aggressive than SARS. SARS was very easily knocked on the head. It was easily killed, it was easily finished by simple things like quarantine, social distancing and hygiene. Now influenza would never be stopped by quarantine and social distancing. Never, never, never. Let's assume that SARS had acquired the trait of being infectious before the onset of symptoms. That would have been a major problem for us. Influenza would seem like child's play in comparison. CDC headquarters in Atlanta is on red alert. Flu expert Tim Uyiki is preparing to leave for Hanoi to assist Carlo Obani. Yet urgent questions are still unanswered. Which face masks should he take? Will flu medications help? Uyiki and Urbani have been in contact via email and telephone for days. But then things take an unexpected turn. I arrived in Hanoi on the evening of March 11, 2003, and at that on that very day in Hanoi, uh, Dr. Urbani had developed a fever. Carlo Urbani, despite the fever, has flown to a conference in Bangkok. After being rushed to the hospital, the doctor knows he must have been infected with the mysterious virus. Four days later, Singapore Airlines SQ-25 from New York lands in Frankfurt. Passenger Ho Nam Leong, a physician from Singapore, was at a conference in the US and became ill. As he boarded the plane to Frankfurt, he called one of his colleagues, who in turn notified WHO. A quarantine ambulance is already awaiting his arrival at the airport. Head of operations Rene Gottschalk puts all 250 passengers under quarantine. The patient himself is taken to the university clinic. Head virologist Hans Richard Brott and his team will be wearing protective suits while treating him over the course of several weeks. Dr. Leong was treating patients with suspicious cases of pneumonia in Singapore, including Esther Mock, one of the three flight attendants from Singapore who was infected in the Metropole Hotel. The deadly pathogen from Asia came through the US to Europe in the body of her doctor. Samples are immediately sent to high security laboratories in Marburg and Hamburg. The physicians in Frankfurt will save Dr. Leong. The SARS attack was warded off in Germany. <laughs> the SARS virus was really quite enough for us. A germ that in part can jump from one super spreader patient to 170 others, and that is lethal in 10% of the cases, that is a highly dangerous germ. Reacting to the SARS case at the Frankfurt airport, 
WHO headquarters in Geneva now rolls out their heaviest artillery. For the first time in its history, the World Health Organization issues a global alert. In order to give this demon a name, WHO labels it Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, abbreviated SARS. Instead of dealing with one distressed member state, we were dealing with 192 distressed member states. And the political and the, the communications aspects of that, how does WHO maintain credibility by putting out credible messages while at the same time not providing too much reassurance about what we don't know? Blood and tissue samples from the infected arrive simultaneously at 13 high security labs around the world. Recipients include Stefan Becker in Marburg, Christian Drosten in Hamburg and Albert Osterhaus in Rotterdam. In a telephone marathon, WHO persuaded the prestigious labs to sacrifice individual credit and collaborate in dismantling the SARS pathogen. Without a test for SARS, they will be unable to distinguish it from a simple cold in the early stages of the disease. Under the strictest security, for the first time the SARS virus is seen beneath electron microscopes. Its genome is decoded. It isn't until much later that the researchers discover the SARS virus originates from bats and that it was transmitted to humans from civets. Civets are a culinary specialty in southern China. It took exactly one week from the first samples being placed in a cell culture in Frankfurt to identification here in Hamburg. And for four days of this week, the cell culture just sat around. You have to admit, that was extremely fast. It was unique in history, I think, that, uh, that you had a human virus disease or a human infectious disease and that the problem was solved basically in a month, in a month's time. If you would have led that to the normal system of competition, it would not have worked. It would have taken much longer. And I'm even afraid that it would have gone to a pandemic situation, that that particular virus would have spread worldwide. It's unprecedented in human history that a disease has emerged into the human population in an explosive fashion and has been put right back in the box within, in, 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 in evolutionary terms, a, a tiny amount of time. So I think the world has to take great credit for that. I think, on the other hand, what we learned is, well, are we vulnerable? For days now, Carlo Urbani has been fighting for his life in a quarantine station in Thailand. His wife, Juliana, can only speak with him via an intercom. Juliana, scusami. Mi hanno dato la morfina. Lasciami dormire. On this Saturday morning, his heart stops beating. Carlo Urbani dies at 11.45 a.m.
To this day, there is no cure for the SARS virus. There is no vaccine. So doctors can't do anything but simply treat the patient's symptoms to keep them alive. And with SARS, the main organ affected is the lung. The virus massively reduces lung capacity, especially in older patients. And in the end, they suffocate from within. In Atlanta next year, they will continue their exercise of the bird flu outbreak because a mutated influenza virus is the next most likely enemy. The CDC experts will close airports and schools, organize ambulance services, distribute medication and secure the supply of foodstuffs or of coffins. The logistics they claim can be used for any sort of outbreak whether caused by a new, unknown virus or by a bioterror attack. Infected persons will be able to slip through any border controls. At the beginning, it's always a fight against an invisible enemy. It's a global community now, uh, where we're, we're all spending half our time running around the world. And so we're all at risk. It doesn't matter where it starts. It will be on our doorstep within 24 hours. In episode two, we visit field researchers in remote areas of the world on the hunt for unknown viruses and their animal hosts. For the most part, monkeys, birds and bats have been living in peaceful coexistence with viruses for millennia. But these viruses can be deadly to us.